I used to have a lot of friends and the vast majority of my friends uh, stopped talking to me. Do you get tired of talking about that, the stranger article? Because how often do you have to talk about it now? I talk about it like every other day, probably. <laughs> um, I'm not I'm not tired of talking about it. I do tend to say the same thing. So I will say, so if anybody watching this or listening to this <laughs> has heard me before, they will hear me say the same things that they have heard me say many times. Skip um, it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it is, you know, this article really changed my life. Um and so I have to, uh, you know, it's never, it's not gonna, it's not gonna go away. It, so it changed my life, and I think it also is sort of prescient. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sick of talking about about it. Okay, yet. in that case, let's yeah. talk about it because I'm sure a lot of people will know who you are who are listening. Some won't. British people don't always know what's going on in America and stuff all the way over there. So could you sort of tell me a little bit about? It was about detransitioning, which I suppose we should explain to people who don't know what that is. Yeah, I, I think your British listeners are probably more uh, more appraised of the situation than American listeners in some ways, because the conversation there is uh, is sort of more public. Um, so detransitioning is when, when somebody uh, transitions from one sex or gender to the other, and then changes their mind, and then and then transitions back. And so in 2017, um, I was I was writing for The Stranger, which is Seattle's alt weekly, um, one of the last uh, alt weekly. So. Do you have alt weeklies in the in the UK? Alternative weekly paper is what it means. Yeah. Alt week. Oh, every other week. Alt weekly. It, so the alt means alternative. It doesn't mean that would be like alt biweekly. Oh, uh, yeah. But the stranger is actually was actually alt biweekly because ah. because the publishing schedule changed. But it, what it means is like the alternative news. So not the mainstream news. The sort of leftist lefty news. Um, so it was a weekly, a free weekly paper that would um, that, you know would be on. In uh, restaurants and cafes and and and, uh, and paper stands and things like this, and it was always free. And uh, and so the stranger. Um, so I wrote this piece on detransitioners in 2017, and the piece was. And this is the part where I start to repeat myself when I describe the when I describe the piece. It was I always say the same thing. It was not an opinion piece. It was deeply reported, thoroughly fact checked, and it was a, a profile of. I think I had six or seven detransitioners in this piece and they talked about their experience and they all told me the same thing, which was essentially that that socially detransitioning was harder than transitioning, which I was very interested in because you would think that transitioning would be harder, you know, you would just think so. And, but it wasn't um, because they really lost their communities um, and were viewed as sort of traitors and heretics to, to, the, to the trans cause. And so I wrote this piece, and uh, and there was this crazy firestorm, um, and people burned stacks of the paper and sent me video of it. Uh, they put up flyers around Seattle calling me transphobic. Stickers, there are still stickers in Seattle calling me transphobic, uh, and there's a sticker of a picture of my face calling me a Nazi sympathizer. Um, it's a cute picture though, so I should thank them for it. And and it really changed my life in a lot of ways because. In some ways, it was really good because it it really increased my profile. It was the best thing I could have done for my career. I got a staff job at The Stranger. I was a freelancer at the time. I got a staff job out of it. But socially, it was really difficult and remains so. And I was essentially um, excommunicated from my own communities. And I'm a lesbian. I've been in, in queer circles since I was you know, 19, 20 years old. And most of my friends dropped me because of this piece. And the piece wasn't... It wasn't uh, anti-trans. It wasn't bigoted. It was. It was. I made sure to to talk about how you know the difficulties that trans people do face, and there were various bills at the time, and there still are trying to uh, trying to minimize trans rights. Uh, things like bathroom bills that would force them to use the bathroom of their natal sex, and um and I sort of did all of the hedging, and it didn't really matter. Uh, people were really pissed about it, um, but again, it was. The best thing for my career, and I sometimes think I should send all of the people who yelled at me a fruit basket because they turned what could have been a, a sort of blip on the radar into a really massive story. So thank you. 
<laughs> I suppose what they would argue then, they're saying that you're pointing out with by putting this article out there, and obviously it was factual and objective. I suppose, let's say you'd written, uh, here are six uh, Jewish people who hate, who, who love, sure. who hate Israel. It would yeah. be almost like you could take that as being politically motivated, like, see, you can... Yeah. Although I do think that if I had written here six people who hate Israel, I think I would have, in Seattle, that would have gone over really yes. well. That <laughs> yes. would have been very popular. No, I, I understand. And I wrote in the piece about, I asked people about this, you know, your stories can be co-opted. And I asked people about this. So I so I sewed that sort of all into the narrative, talking about the difficulty of, of being in this position and even writing about this. Because these people, you know, we don't have good data on, on detransitioners. People oftentimes say it's rare. I think I said it was rare in the piece. We don't actually know how rare it is because we don't have any data on it. Um, but they are, as far as I can tell, outliers. That doesn't mean their exper experience isn't worth writing about. Trans people are outliers. And yeah. I don't think many trans would say their experience isn't worth writing about. And then a, a lot of the attacks were based on my own I hate the word identity, but my own identity because I'm not trans. Um, and so this idea that I shouldn't be writing about something um, that wasn't that didn't align with my own experience, which I find ridiculous, a very silly position. Yeah, it would mean murderers, only murderers can write about murder. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Mm. Which would be interesting, but, uh, <laughs> but would put a lot of us out of work. Yeah, well, depends on the per I don't know what you do in your spare time. True, true, true. So you don't know what's in my basement. What might I have mis misread about? That's one of those things, by the way. I've just casually, like, twenty years later, when I find out you're a mass murderer, <laughs> and like he was told that, and he he she literally said it to his Ignore face, it. and he just Ignore moved it. to the next question. Well, I don't have a basement, so you're in luck. Okay, okay, they're in the roof. They're in the um, attic, yeah. So. I, what, okay, I think I might have misunderstood this. So tell me, where am I getting like an 80% an statistic about trans people de, de whatever, detransitioning? I don't know where that statistic comes I from. I think someone said that about you. I think they might have falsely claimed you said, have you seen all the stuff where well, I presume you have, there's like these weird Wikipedia entries, but they're not really Wikipedia. It's yeah, like they're like written by bots. Oh, yes. Maybe, or maybe that's what it is. Or there children. are those, yeah. Yeah, or children, or children. <laughs> some I want. I've got some of the quotes because I just found them really funny. Do you mind me just reading them? Yeah, please do. Um, so it says these things. It's sort of it's a wiki trans page about you. And oh, says, that I don't know who, who wrote Katie that. Katie has not yet disclosed her exact birth details to the media as of now. So <laughs> it does say your date of birth, I think, but it doesn't have your exact birth details. And then it says we are also unaware of her zodiac sign. Oh well, I cannot. I cannot reveal that. I, you know what? I will. I am a Taurus, but I identify as a Gemini. Okay. Oh, that's good. Okay. We estimate her height to be somewhere around five feet, seven inches. I appreciate that. There you go. It gave me an extra inch and a <laughs> half, but I appreciate that. Sadly, her parents' names and their professions have not yet been Sadly. disclosed by her at the moment. I, my, yeah. my parents' names are actually, I talk about them quite frequently. My parents, no. uh, it's not no. hard to find. No, yeah. not out there. Sadly. How weird is that? That is weird. That does sound like it was written by a bot. I think I feel, but the sadly bit, like, can bots be that good? Yeah, or or uh, maybe a, a bot where uh, English is their second language. Mm, I was imagining just someone who was just really angry at you and was just like, yeah. oh, so who's ringing the doorbell? I might just leave it. Oh, it's a food. Hopefully they'll just put it downstairs. You can go get it. I mean, I'm not in a rush. You can oh, feel free to oh, go oh, take God. care of it. Oh. Hello. Hello. <laughs> oh, food delivery. We get this like... Oh, I'm tired now, so I'm going to have to ask you a question in a second and just like wait here quietly. We get like this, you know, when it's all made already, like not made, it's all the right ingredients. And then. Yeah, just, like a blue apron or something like that. Yeah. We, call, we got it called Gusto. Mm, oh, gusto. My. That's the first like fitness I've done in like six months. Oh, right. Well, you know what? Today's the first day of the rest of your life. You oh, did right. it. You broke the seal. Yeah. I started doing exercise for like two months, like five months ago. But I was playing soccer, football. Um, and I tore a hamstring. So oh, I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't walk for a few months after that. So, that's, well, that's a good excuse it. not to do exercise. What's the point in any of it? Oh, <laughs> what were we talking about? I don't even know. What are we doing? Uh, we're talking about some trans shit. Oh, the um, the fake Wikipedia. That was so thing. funny. Yeah, yeah. I was actually just laughing looking. I just couldn't. But, but you're right. It probably is a bot, which makes it less funny. Okay, so we don't know going back to serious stuff, how many people are detransitioning? De 
No, we don't know. I don't know where the 80% statistic came from. That seems wildly inflated to me. And normally the statistics are probably under, under, uh, I don't know, underinflated. Is that a word? Um, I have no idea what the, what the, what the number is. And I don't think anybody else does either. Cause the thing is, a lot of people don't, it would be great if we had statistics on this, but a lot of people like the detrans, the detransitioners I know that I interviewed and, and that I follow on social media. They typically don't go back to their clinicians or doctors or therapists and say, hey, change my mind. They typically don't. And so their their clinicians might not ever even know that they're detransitioning, which is a shame. They should know if people are, you know, having negative outcomes from their um, uh, from these interventions. Yeah. I mean, are you are you concerned? I mean, I know that article didn't have any opinion in it. Are you concerned about people? you know, maybe feeling like they're one gender or the other uh, as children and then transitioning or as, as young adults? Yeah. Yeah, I am concerned about it. I think so in my own life, um, I don't have a, a great number on this either, but the number of, of people I know who have uh, transitioned from male to female or adopted non -bi a non-binary identity is really astronomical just in the past maybe five or 10 years. Um, and I don't have a, I don't have like hard numbers on this, but dozens and dozens of people. It's so common. It's so common within my circles. Just here's a, here's a, I started thinking about this in 2012, 2013. I was living in a small town in North Carolina and, um, or I, no, not small. I was living in Charlotte, North Carolina. So I was living in a city and I had a good friend there who was a trans guy and he had moved there from a small town, a smaller town in North Carolina. And he had lived in a household with five lesbians which is all already in itself like fairly rare to have a you know a small town have five five lesbians at the same age not that rare I mean now I saw some study yesterday that apparently forty percent of, of Gen Z identifies as LGBT or Q I think wow. probably heavy emphasis on the Q I don't know any lesbians I don't think I know a single one Well hey now now you know one Yes um, Yes I got one I got one gay friend I got I got like that's four it. friends so yeah. that that's the thing. Yeah. Online friends count that you can count okay. them too, yes. if you have to, if you must. <laughs> and, um, and so I, so I became good friends with this trans guy and he had lived in this small town in this house with five lesbians and he transitioned and within a year, every one of his housemates had transitioned. And he told me this in about, tw I think this was in 2013. And my reaction to that was, that is statistically impossible. Something is going on here. This is such an anomaly because because the rates of trans people have always been incredibly low. Yes, trans people with gender dysphoria have long existed. That is true. But that is just incredibly, the numbers just didn't make sense to me. And uh, 10 years later, so almost 10 years later, <laughs> every lesbian is a trans man. It's just, it's, or non binary. I mean, not, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but like, for instance, okay, I moved to Seattle. And uh, when I moved to Seattle, I hung out with a group of me and four other, four other lesbians. No, me and five other lesbians, sort of in a little group, and we would hang out. All of them except for me and one other person as either trans or non-binary now. Um, four of them have or now go by they or he. Three have had top surgery. Three are on hormones or have had top surgery. Uh, two, I think, are just sort of go by non-binary pronouns. It's a really, it's, the numbers just don't make any sense. So my own lived experience um, tells me that this is that something is happening, and I think what's happening is a social contagion. I I don't want to minimize what gender dysphoria is. I think it could be a deeply painful experience for people, but I also think that a lot of people are sort of latching on to this identity because their friends are, and I realize that that's going to be offensive to a lot of people. But I also think that this is true, and because the numbers just don't make sense otherwise, this vast increase in people seeking referrals to gender clinics people getting top surgery and hormones. It just, unless there's something in the water, it just doesn't make sense otherwise. But this is anecdotal, isn't it? The amount of people. So we don't, we don't know or do well, we? Well, we do have some data. I mean, we have data from the UK, for instance, if I don't have the numbers offhand, but you can look at the number of referrals to, through the NHS, through, uh, through uh, gender identity clinics for youth. It's over a thousand percent increase over a certain number of years. And, I, and again, then there's that thing of like, okay, so maybe that was long overdue. And now now people are more accepted and able to do it. I think that's true, too. I think that's true as well. I think there's an element of that for sure. But I just don't think that the numbers that I'm seeing make any sense. Um, yeah, and it, these things happen. You know, it's not as though, you know, when I was in high school, every other girl was bulimic or anorexic or a cutter. 
That stuff isn't as common anymore. But what is common is identifying as queer or non-binary or trans. And we have turned this into a human rights issue in a way. So that makes it in some ways it is a human rights issue, of course. I mean, I do think that people who are trans should have access to healthcare and jobs and housing and all of those things, of course, and whatever, use whatever bathroom they want to, with some exceptions. Um, for instance, like a, a biological male who has done no, absolutely nothing to change his appearance and um, wants to use a women's room or be in a women's prison. I have some problems with that. Sports is the other one. Yeah. Oh, sports is absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, the thing is, I, I don't think, so the fight for trans rights started to be about, when it began, it was about things like access to healthcare, employment, housing, really fundamental issues. And it has crept beyond that into things like males performing on women's swimming teams or whatever, into sports, into prisons, into these things that I think ultimately, and youth transition, which I think ultimately are actually going to harm trans people because it is pushed, it is, it is pushing too far against, uh, against the majority view. And there's backlash and we're seeing the backlash in the United States where states are doing things like banning youth transition. Um, there are bills, you know, banning trans people from playing sports. That's not, I don't, I don't want legislatures involved in these issues in the first place, but that backlash is all, is all coming because activists have pushed too far. Um, and I realize that this is offensive to some people and it makes me sound reactionary, but this is just my observation. This is what is happening in the world. Um, and as someone who actually does care about trans people and trans rights, I think that this is negative. I think that from, I think that activists need to be a little bit more tactical. Um, when they're thinking of these issues and maybe having, you know, trans women on women's sporting st- sports teams is not really the uh, the human rights frontier that um, will ultimately benefit your people. Speaking purely sort of strategically from the trans point of view, though, there are, I guess there are two schools of thought. And one is what you're saying, which is there's going to be this retaliation, which does tend to happen. Uh, and there was that that John Ronson podcast. He does that brilliantly. He talks about uh, nobody cared about abortion, for example. Uh, right. Christi- the Christians didn't care until uh, feminists showed they cared. And then Christians got involved and each one pushed each other higher and higher. Um and so, so there is that argument with the, with the trans issue. People now, people who were perfectly fine before, going like, "Oh, I don't care. You be and dress and act and change whatever you want," are now going, "Hang on, you want to be on our, the, you know, my daughter's sports team, and I'm not." And then they go against the whole thing. So that's one argument. And I suppose the other one is is maybe the Overton window. That thing, if you go so extreme one way, of like, of course, trans people can be like without getting a, a operation or anything, they can be in women's teams and stuff like that. And then everyone's going, "Well, well, that's a bit far." but it might assimilate them in other ways. Uh, I I think it remains to be seen. And, and also in the US, I'm not sure how it is in the UK, but in, in the US, it really depends on where you live. So in Connecticut, it's a blue state like Connecticut, for instance, um, it's, you know, I don't know if this is state law or, or various local laws, but but trans women can play on uh, like a high school track team or whatever. There's famous cases of, of a couple of, of uh, trans Trans girls, high school girls, basically blowing female competition out, out of the water. So you have a place like that or, or, you know, California, Oregon, Washington State, where the laws are going to be much more liberal. And then you have the backlash on the other side in places like Arkansas or Mississippi or Texas or whatever. So it, it's really, I think it's really situational. And you can have very different laws depending on where you live in the United States. With stuff like this, but you said you didn't want legislation involved with things like sports. I mean, how do you solve that issue? Because there was like that video of the swimmer, uh, some college swimmer who just like like finished the race like five laps before the biological women. Like, what yeah, do do? I mean, I I think instead of getting state legislatures involved, because and the reason I don't like the gov- governments getting involved is because this stuff becomes electioneer. It becomes election fodder. It becomes it just. I think it heightens it 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 um it becomes a way for people to basically grandstand and virtue signal or vice signal and and campaign for their own their own demographics um what i would like to see is uh it, instead of state legislators the governing bodies being whatever the in the united states like the ncaa which is the governing bodies of of sports of of college sports um so uh so having it having it much more not even local um but not a governmental body, a uh, whatever, the, whatever's below that, these um, 
whatever body sort of sort of not sort of controls rules and things like that. Um, I would like to see them be the people who step up and say, wait a second, this isn't fair. Or like Olympic, you know, like the Olympic, the OOC, the Olympic Committee or whatever, IOC. Um, of course, you know, they have ruled on this and, and the rules are not the rules that <laughs> I think are, are fair. They've ruled that after a year of a year of uh, estrogen, um, you know, males can compete in female sports. Despite, they've, you know, that's the thing because they will have from puberty, the men will have sort of bigger bone density and things like that, won't they? Bigger hearts, bigger lungs, bigger hands. There's just, there's all sorts of things. It's, and it's complicated, you know, if there, if, if, uh, if a trans woman, a trans girl took puberty blockers and didn't go through male puberty, I think that is slightly different. Um, there is still evidence that even before puberty, males have some advantage over girls or boys have some advantage over girls when it comes to athletics. Um, but which, as a, I was a young athlete, and I was oftentimes the only girl on the little league team, the only girl on the soccer team, whatever. And I was also the worst player. It probably says something more about me than uh, than than biology. But um, but yeah, I think if if somebody has you know has never gone through male puberty, it's it's different. But once you've gone through male puberty, the advantage is obvious. And the thing that really bothers me about this is that we're supposed to. It's very much an emperor has no clothes situation where we're supposed to pretend as though the obvious is not. Everybody knows that males have an advantage, a physical advantage over females in the vast majority of sports. There might be a few where they don't. Um, I don't know, mall walking or something like that. Something um, that? floating, something that requires. It's a, like where grandmas get together and they exercise in the mall. They walk. We don't really have malls anymore, but you know, floating something where like a higher percentage of body fat um, would benefit you. No, not diving. I think diving is. I think males are better divers than females ah. it was interesting there was that uh i think the u.s soccer team the what they're the best team in the world the u.s one they often win the world cup and i think before when just before winning the world cup they played against an under 15s um amateur college side in the states i think it was in texas and they got absolutely torn apart by these 15 year old and yet, boys and some of these like megan rapino the star of the women's yes. soccer still advocates for trans women to play in sports yeah if they're on her team yeah if they're on her team yeah yeah but you're gonna if they're not she's gonna put herself out of a job um yeah, yeah so I, I i find that really baffling too that that so many women are uh i'm sure they think that it's the right thing to do and it looks really good but i find it really baffling because we all know that there, <laughs> we all know there is a difference we do there's a lot of talk on 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 social media about lived experience which drives me mad actually because i think I, what does lived experience mean? I mean, listen to people. Experience. But, yeah. yeah, we listen to people, but it's, you know, that's that's not how we decide things on someone's lived Because my lived I would say mad things based on my lived experience. You shouldn't right. trust me. So right. uh, Caitlyn Jenner said, came out and said she doesn't want uh, trans people to be on, on women's uh, sports teams. And everyone went crazy at her. And it was like, oh, lived experience until she disagrees right. with something you want. Sarah Silverman got all upset about that one. Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah, but yeah, I do. But the thing about Caitlyn Jenner is that her opinion doesn't count because she's a Republican. Yeah, well, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, you would think that, that someone who is, you know, one of the greatest athletes of of, uh, yeah. of of their lifetime, of their generation. Was she really good? I don't even know. Yeah, yeah, she was a she was a, an Olympian, um, like a good, like a really good one. I think so. For, yeah, yeah, I think so. Right, I need to look that up. I'm not that into athletics, really. I like my football and stuff. More of a podcaster. More of a podcaster. No, I watch football all the time. I'm obsessed with football and stuff, and and you know, but not that that matters. Is there are, is women's football big in the UK? No, no. Really, really, but not at all. It's, it's actually not big anywhere except America. in the US. Yeah. Well, that I guess that explains why we have the best, the best yeah. team in the world. <laughs> it is partly that, and also like this huge, you know, a, a population, right? It's one of yeah. those, just yeah. enormous population. But there's a, yeah, and there's a lot like youth soccer is a very much like do, do girls play f like youth football? No, okay, youth football or soccer. There'll be people listening. There'll be people listening going, "What are you talking about? I play." You know, how dare they don't they don't mind all the very controversial trans discussion, but don't say we don't play yeah. soccer because I play all football. We play football. Yeah, um, it's netball. Is is netball lacrosse? Netball. Which and and lacrosse. Oh. In, well, netball is like basketball without you're not allowed to move when you have the ball. It's quite a good game. Oh, huh. I've never even heard of this. A lot of girls play that at school. A lot of girls play lacrosse, which I think in other countries, maybe the states, that's more of a man's sport. It's a yeah. The girls play field hockey here. 
Yeah, yeah. Whereas I think men and women do that equally here. Uh, but a lot of lacrosse and... Interesting. Netball. Yeah, soccer is a very much... Youth soccer is very much a co-ed thing. It, like every every suburban kid played on a, on a youth soccer team. Um, yeah, and then very quickly within within several years, you know, they separate themselves into ability bands with girls being typically uh, much, much worse than boys. And I think there are ways to... Like I, I've gone to a couple of WNBA games, uh, women's national or yeah, women's basketball. basketball, pro basketball, mm. and they're they don't at all compare to men's basketball games. And I think that a, a solution there would be to they're playing on the, they have the same size basketball, they have the same size. It's still a ten foot ten foot hoop. The court's the same size. Make it smaller. Yeah. Just make it smaller. Same thing with soccer. Yeah, make it goals. smaller. Make yeah. It's ridiculous. You see these people, they're like, they're like five foot seven or something or five foot eight, the goalkeepers yeah. are just fairly tall for a woman or five foot nine even. But these goals are like, I'm six foot four and I can't, I can't reach the, yeah. the top. So what's, yeah. So the, you end up seeing the result of that. You, you see these ridiculous goals and it makes yeah. the sport look silly because they can't yeah. reach it. So the ball just goes blop over their head. It's not a right. lack of ability. It's just right. the physical the, the physical, the field is the same size. Make the field smaller. Make everything, shrink everything down a little bit. And I think that the sports would be more interesting to, as, a, as a spectator. If you could see women dunk, which they very rarely do, that would be more interesting. But for some reason that hasn't, maybe it's because the facilities are, you're using the same, but it wouldn't be that hard to lower a fucking basketball goal. (laughs) Uh, I guess it'd be harder to shrink the court, but, um, but yeah, that hasn't happened. Yeah. That's, you have to keep painting over it. I want to get onto, not, not, not too much though, because it's going to be quite academic then, but so Judith Butler, right? So mm-hmm. my understanding of Judith Butler, which is which is very little, like everyone's understanding of Judith Butler, she writes impossibly. They, Judith Butler is now a they. Oh, right. Oh, God. Uh, they. <laughs> they write extraordinarily, you know, densely and horribly. Dense, so, and yeah. we had to, you know, I know you did English at university, I think. So I did that as well. And so you have to do some Judith Butler at some point. And I got it, I thought. And I thought it was like, the idea was, there's no such thing in, in her mind as like man things and women things. Um, but that you, it's just all conditioned by society. And if you get, there's no reason yeah. a man can't have pink things just to be very simplistic yeah. about it. A woman kind of, which was the case back in the day anyway, the colors changed around that kind of thing. And you can just do your thing. And now I seem to understand, it seems to be that like, oh, if you're doing women things as a man, that means you actually need to be a woman. Is that what's happened? That is what, it, yes, I don't know what, what Butler would say about this because I find Butler incomprehensible. But yes, that is my main objection to this new gender ideology, which I think is it's best embodied in the idea of non-binary. So the idea that if I, as a woman or you as a man, or I as a female and you as a male, if we reject our gender roles, then we are literally not men or literally not women. We are something else. I find that incredibly regressive. It's like saying I'm I'm different. Gender roles for thee, but not for me. For me, um, I, I, yes, and and it is ironic to me that this is seen as somehow progressive when it is actually not. It is not progressive at all to say if you are a male and you enjoy typically female things, if you want to wear a dress or paint your fingernails, then you are not actually a man. That is, that is making gender roles more, not less, intractable. Um, so that's my, I, I really this non-binary thing. I find it. Very silly, uh, very arrogant, very narcissistic, but also very regressive. Uh, as you can imagine, this is not a very popular position to take um, in Seattle and in queer circles. Well, I'm worried about it as well. And it's actually, we're almost, I think about 100 episodes in I, 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 with this podcast. And it's like the one thing I've never touched actually until today. And I've got in a, in a week or two, there's somebody in the UK who's quite Debbie Hayton, I think, mm-hmm. who's a trans person she's, who's- Yeah, she's good. Yeah, because yeah, she's, she's sort of, tra- it, I guess trans in the sense that, great, she wants to be sort of a woman or trans and that's great, but she doesn't doesn't go along with a lot of the, the tenets of the ideology that a lot of us find uh, to yeah. get on board with. So the thing is, what's hard for me, and maybe it's because I'm getting older and stuff, but I, I don't wake up and feel like a man or a woman. No. I just sort of yeah. am. And if I were to wake up one day and I'm a woman, I actually think I'd quite enjoy that. I'd be like, oh, oh this is interesting i'm a woman now for a few weeks and then i'll be i don't really care i'll still do the same stuff i 
did. So it's very hard for me to relate. And maybe that's an oversight of mine. Maybe that's just me and you and a lot of other people aren't good. We just can't quite empathize with some people who very much feel like us. Because what I, I don't really get what that means to feel like a gender. Well, there's this idea that ever that all of us have this gender identity inside of us, like it's an organ or a soul. And I don't believe in the soul, and I also don't believe in gender identity. I think that some people have a condition, a people get mad when I say this, but for lack of a better term, a mental condition, uh, a something, a some sort of pathological problem um, that you know makes them feel as though they were born in the wrong body, makes them feel as though they were. But that doesn't mean – the idea of gender identity didn't even emerge until the 1960s. This is a relatively new idea. But it has become sacrosanct within some circles, and we're supposed to accept it, that all of us have a gender identity. And this is something that is being taught – this morning I watched a video that is being um, – it's part of the curriculum for – for Seattle public schools, this is taught to kindergartners, and it tells them that everybody has a gender identity, everybody has a gender inside them, and sometimes your gender aligns with your body, and sometimes it doesn't. I just don't believe that. I don't think I have a gender identity. I think I have a biological sex. I don't, like, where does the gender identity live? Maybe in the brain, I guess. But there's been no, like, nobody can do a brain scan and tell us what this thing is the same way that they can't find a soul. Um, and it, it feels very, I don't know, it feels very postmodern and, uh, and imaginary to me. But a lot of people just sort of accept that this is real and that we all have one. And I don't think that I do. I want to get to uh, emotions uh, with you, Katie. So when, when it all came out and, and the, the, the Stranger article and everything, you know, you weren't, um, you said you didn't feel at home in lesbian clubs anymore and things like that. How did that actually, I know you're saying now things are sort of got, things have gotten better for it and, you know, but how did that feel at the time for you? It was horrible and it's actually still terrible because I continue to, um, so this is four years later and it continues to impact my relationships. Um, I used to have a lot of friends and, the vast majority of my friends uh, stopped talking to me from all over the country. And not only that, like I found out recently, I so I live in Seattle. I'm in North Carolina for two months. This is where I'm from. And so because I was home, you know, for the first time in a long time, spending some real time here, I wanted to see some of my old friends. And I reached out to some people and um, – Nobody responded to me. And so I was talking to another friend about this and I was sort of, you know, upset, sort of what, like, why, what is going on? Why won't anybody talk to me? And she said, well, you know, um, it's the trans stuff. People have come to us all. Other people who don't know me have come to us all and they have said that they have told us that we can't be friends with you. And my friend, this one friend I was talking to, you know, didn't unperson me or defriend me, but she did say, um, you know, this isn't your place to talk about this. You shouldn't be talking about this stuff, which I find kind of ironic because if I were going around tranting, trans women are women, nobody would have a problem with the fact that I'm not trans, that I'm a cis person talking about this. It's what I'm saying. It's not who I am. It's what I'm saying. That's the problem. Um, so this has continued to impact my life. It's, uh, it's, it's terrible. It's, it's really hard to lose your friends in your community and I've made new friends, but you know, people I lived with for years, people whose weddings I went to people I loved have all almost all disappeared from my life because of this article and because I won't shut up about it. And, um, yeah, it's really, it's really fucking hard. Was that a bit of a shock for you when you got back recently? Yes, it was, it was, um, I, cause there are, cause it's four years later and there are people like I've had relationships with people, people who even continue to talk to me, who I continue to see in the meantime. And I didn't realize that and like something, I don't know what it is, but something else happened. There was some catalyst and nobody, and I don't know what the details are, but anyway, yes, it, it was surprising to me because there are some people I've been in touch with throughout this time who just recently have, have, um, you know, blocked me on on social media and won't respond to my messages not that i'm like stalking them or like 
spending a lot of time trying to get their attention, but um, there's a few people who who I like had hoped to see while I was here, and it's been made very clear to me that I that they don't want to see me, and it's because of this stuff. I'm so sorry to hear that. Thank you. It's terrible, but um, you know I have a lot of friends now who are in their seventies. People <laughs> seventy and above tend to like me. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a funny thing though, isn't it? Because um, I feel like. My friends, close friends of mine, they could come to me with anything. So they could say to me uh, that they've just killed someone. Yeah. Now, I don't think I would go and bury the body with them because I don't want to. I'd be like, I'm so, so sorry. I can't help you. Um, yeah. As long as they didn't do it from a psychopathic kind. If it was like, I've just done it. And I don't want to do, you know, but anything. And and maybe your friends even would have done as well if you said, I've the, killed someone. I have thought of this. I have thought of this because there are like there. I will. I won't sugarcoat it. There are things that I did when I was in my 20s and partying a lot and drinking a lot. I did some really dumb shit and people stuck by me. You know, like, you know, like, I don't want to go into details, but I, I did some, I like, I, I partied a lot. I was a drinker. I, yeah. you know. What's the worst thing you ever did? I won't tell you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it was just sort of a little, you know, sort of a little hooligan and running around making trouble for people and making life difficult for people, including other friends. And, um, and people stuck by me when I had done things that actually hurt individual human beings who we knew and loved and cared about and people stuck by me. And the worst thing that you can be perceived as in queer circles is transphobic. And people think that I'm transphobic. I'm sure people would also like toss racism onto there um, for good measure. But yeah, I have thought about a lot that I could, I think I could, I could literally hit somebody with my car and, uh, and somebody would forgive me for that. Um, Caitlin whereas, Jenner did do that. And was yeah, she did do that. She did do that. But, but then she said that biological males shouldn't play, play on a, on, on the, in the WNBA. And that's what really right. did it. Did, did you hear that Ricky Gervais joke about that? No. He said, she's done so, so much brave woman. She's done so much for trans rights, not so much for women driver stereotypes. <laughs> It's funnier also when he says it, but um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a great, you know, there was that guy who was in the actor who was in King of Queens. Do you see him the other day um, apologizing for being friends with Dave, Dave Chappelle? Chappelle? Yeah, he, he had to oh, apologize. He apologized. Yeah. People are cowards. You know, in there, I get it. There's immense social pressure to uh, to denounce and conform and to not be the bad guy. And, um, you know, I think we're just in this, I think this is cyclical and we're in this It's a strange moment. Um, in in time where people are terrified and there's these witch hunts happening and so people are doing things like denouncing each other and i think that this will change i'm hopeful that it will um, but these things come and go you know there was the satanic panic in the 1980s and 90s there was the red scare we're very humans are we're a mimetic species we're incredibly social we 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 mimic the things that we see around us and there's nothing i think inherently wrong with that it's just it's just the nature of the animal it's just who we are um but yeah it is uh actually louis ck has some line about how you know when things go wrong you figure out who your friends are and who wants that <laughs> which i, I think he's right about yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean that thing of like apologizing for being friends with Dave Chappelle. I find it so sad, particularly with Dave Chappelle and, and J.K. Rowling, who are two people who had to sort of overcome other inequality issues of being black or being a woman and being J.K. Rowling, such like an icon. A lot of her writing is really sort of. I know, I know it's been analyzed again, again and again now. Now it's like, oh look, this one was a racist and this was anti-Semitic and this was the Godless right, and Harry Potter. Right, right, right. It's like she was. She did so much, I think, for feminism and that kind of thing. And so many women around the world look up to her. Well, there's also this. This, this thing of of judging, you know, she wrote the first Harry or published the first Harry Potter books twenty years ago, you know, and in judging things things of the past by the standards of today, nobody's going to come out looking good. Nobody, not the wokest motherfucker in the world. Like things were different, you know, and there's very little forgiveness for this. We're seeing this. We're seeing this now, of course, in the U.S. with this massive scandal surrounding Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. um, there's been this revisionist history where, you know, now there's this idea that white people in no, in 
no context is it ever appropriate, nor has it ever been appropriate for white people to say the N word, hard R, hard A, or soft A, whatever. That's just not true. That's not how it was. It used to be okay to sing to sing along with Biggie Smalls lyrics, um, and now it's not. Um, and of course, things change, and we have to adjust to new taboos. But to find some video of of anybody, some fifteen year old or or Joe Rogan or whatever, saying a word that was not so taboo at the time he was saying it, or he wouldn't have said it, um, and then judging it by the standards of today. It's very bizarre. I went to see uh, Ricky Gervais live in London recently, not as a mate of mine, of course, but just that his, he was doing a stand-up. And he um, he does say that, and he says we should never have do that, we should never really criticise because you don't know what it's going to be in 10 or 20 years' time from now. And he said, he said nobody would have predicted the worst possible thing you can say on Twitter now is, uh, you know, men have penises. Like, that's like <laughs> the worst thing. So he said, I mean, that Gervais thing, honestly, because if they thought, it hasn't come out on Netflix yet, but it was filmed, this was a couple of months ago I was there, so like, I don't know when how long that takes to come out on Netflix, but it will make the Dave Chappelle one look like nothing. It was like I can't a wait for thousand this. times. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I think there must be some people right now yeah. at like Netflix HQ just going like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if we can release this. Yeah. So I hope he that, had a good contract. Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe. He might that. have to release it on his own. Straight maybe. to YouTube. Man, it's like even I was just like, oh no. Oh no, he didn't just <laughs> It was just like it was so much. Oh my word! Um, tell me a bit about Blocked and Reported. How like about the podcast and everything? What kind of hijinks you you and Jesse Single get up to? Um, so we talk a lot about the same stuff that you and I are talking about. We talk about culture wars. Um, we talk about it's it's it's. I, I'm always a little bit at a loss of how to describe the show because it's a little bit media criticism. It's a lot of media criticism. Both Jesse and I have you know have worked in the media. And so um, it's a lot of that. But we also talk about these sort of um, small niche internet subcultures, like for a show we're going to record tomorrow, I'm talking about some drama within the knitting world, um, about racism in the knitting world. And so we oh. talk about, it's a lot about, it's about the internet and what it's doing to us um, as a people. Because I think it is changing us in, in various ways, mostly for the worst. Not entirely, but mostly for the worst. So it's a little bit about what's going on right now in the world with politics and culture. Um, and then it's a little bit about dumb internet bullshit. Okay. When you're talking about these things, let's say the trans issues or uh, critical race theory and stuff, do you ever have these moments when you go, oh, shit, what if I'm wrong about like every... Because how can you oh, know? Yeah. How can I know? How can anyone know? They're just as sure. The other side are just as sure as you yeah. are. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm. it's totally possible that we're wrong about everything i, I believe that that would be uh, awful i mean it, it would and it wouldn't i mean i think being wrong and having to uh correct yourself and it feels very difficult and very and, and um it's hard to do you know it's hard to do but there's some sort of there's a little bit of an irony there because if you make a mistake and you own up to it, like legitimately own up to it, not in this sort of like I am apologizing for my past sins kind of way, but if you're actually wrong about something, yeah. typically it has the effect, it makes you look good to admit when you got something wrong. Typically, not always. And I think that that's true, even though it can feel it can feel very impossible to say like I was wrong about this, even correcting actual factual mistakes. Um, issuing corrections as a journalist, nobody wants to do that. But when you do it, when you own up, I got this wrong. I think it actually, it, it, uh, oftentimes, at least in people of good faith, it sort of raises your level of esteem because you've admitted that you've done something wrong. This isn't true when I think it, it comes to sort of like apologizing for things that you didn't do wrong, you know, or apologizing for being friends with friends with people, but getting factual errors. Um, but I think it's it's totally possible that we're wrong about all this stuff. I don't think so. I think in five or ten or twenty years, people are going to be looking back on this trans stuff and saying, "What the fuck were we thinking?" Um, and I fully expect some apologies from some people. <laughs> but that, but that this is the problem with that. I thought about that before, and it's like that doesn't happen because what happens is gradually people start to change, and then they don't recognize yeah. that they were on the other side they themselves. Were, I know. So then everyone's true. like, "Ha, huh, where's the apology?" And it's like, "Well, we're all we're all on that one side." If that does happen, yeah. Well, I've saved receipts, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> where's my apology? And you'll just look. Oh. Yeah. The other thing is, I think it's. I, I agree with you about admitting you're wrong, but you should never apologize because people don't no. want an apology; they want groveling. No. They want you to grovel and get on the floor and weep. 
Yeah, I don't think apologizing is uh, is ever the right move because it's it's an admission that you've done something wrong, even if you don't think that you have publicly. I mean, even your private life, yeah. I think it is good to apologize. Totally, very yeah. different and very different in private life. And there's a difference between apologizing because you say hit somebody with your car on accident, and uh, you know, apologizing for being friends with somebody. Oh, that's mad. That stuff. I do, but I guess I guess this thing of like, like wondering if I might be wrong about stuff is that you know we talked before about that that thing about like abortion and feminism, for example. We start to get heated and we start to move to another side. Mm-hmm. So because that that sort of what we would call it for lack of a better word, maybe the woke side is because I don't want to say left wing because it's not left wing. It's, it's not, a section yeah. um, because they're being so you know heavy handed uh, with their movement. It's pushing people away, and I see friends of mine, and it's like okay, well now it goes from being like they're quite sort of liberal and progressive and whatever, and they're seeing all this stuff, and it's like outrageous, like the, some of the woke stuff, and then it moves on to like oh look at this Jordan Peterson video and Joe Rogan and stuff like that, and it's like okay, okay, and then it goes to like Ben Shapiro who's like this like anti-abortion facts don't have feelings right and he's saying facts don't have feelings while literally wearing a religious symbol on his head Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. which i find extraordinary and Mm -hmm. and it's like but then i'm sort of listening to him and i'm sort of enjoying what half of what he's saying and i'm going oh yeah Mm -hmm. so are you do you worry about that getting swept up in in that yeah i i think that the the right left dichotomy doesn't work anymore um yes i i mean i don't my politics haven't really changed that much since all of this started. In some ways, they have, like the way that I vote hasn't changed. My sort of the way I think about politics have changed in the sense that, like, I grew up sort of a knee jerk liberal for most of my life. I genuinely believed that conservatives were evil or stupid or both. I genuinely thought that. Me too. Yeah. And I don't think that anymore. And part of that is because of the reaction to my own, my piece on detransition and other things that I've written. I've gotten much more positive feedback from, pr- frankly, libertarians. So, like, not social conservatives, but people who are who are you know libertarian. And so, I've really changed my mind about 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 that. I've looked into to their politics more. I I I care much more about individual issues than I do sort of the party line on things. Um, and I I have seen I haven't okay f- like audience capture is always a concern. And our audience for our show is sort of left of center, I think. But we have a lot of people who are, for instance, gender critical, a lot of British feminists who are big fans of Graham Linehan. The writer of Father Ted. Yeah, yeah. I think he's I think he has gone off the deep end. I think he has made some really serious tactical errors. We should say for people who don't who don't know, because some people would just know, oh, the guy from that sitcom in the 90s. Yeah, so Graham got involved in, in the trans fight basically after he was, he made some, in one of his shows, I believe, there was a, a joke about some sort of trans joke. And then he got bullied by a bunch of trans people and allies online. And he jumped like two feet into this fight and it totally destroyed his life. His wife left him. He got kicked off Twitter. I'm sure he can't work anymore. And so now he has become an extremist. He's incredibly dogmatic. And he does things like at one point he posted, so he got kicked off of Twitter, but he has this blog on Substack and he posted photos of a a lesbian. It's not even a lesbian dating app, a queer dating app called Her, I believe. And there are these trans women on the app and they look like males. They look like blokes. Did I say that right? Blokes? You said it very well. Thank you. And, uh, but the app, that's not against the app's terms of service. This app is supposed to be inclusive, right? But Graham saw this and he was offended on behalf of lesbians and he posted all of these random, random people's pictures on his, on his site. And I thought that was tactically stupid and also mean. And, uh, and we talked about it on our podcast. Graham pitched a fit about it, posted a bunch of blogs about how bad Jesse and I are. Oh. Yeah, it was the whole thing. He like hates us, hates John Ronson, people who I used to be friendly with him. I've written about about Graham. I don't think he should be deplatformed or anything like that, but I just think he's made some tactical errors, and I think that the, the culture wars has melted his brain. Um, and so we lost a bunch of subscribers when we were critical of Graham because a lot of our subscribers they sort of it's sort of ironic, you know. Other people will call us transphobic, and, and they sort of believe it, even though we keep saying no, we're not transphobic. We believe in trans rights. And, uh, but there's a certain number of people who, who seemingly believe that and thought that we were more uh, gender-critical activists than we actually are. And so 
you know, I, I worry about audience capture, but I also, after that, for instance, and there have been other times when we've said things that have, um, have alienated or pissed off our audience and they leave, sometimes they come back, sometimes they don't, or various, you know, not in huge numbers, but some people. And so I'm, and so I'm less worried about audience capture because I've seen that we can, Jesse and I can say things that make our own listeners mad, things that we believe, and we won't uh, censor ourselves. And that's really important to me. But I have seen, I do think that the culture war has melted some people's brains. Um, people who I, who I used to respect, people who I, there's a guy named James Lindsay. Are you familiar with James? Yes, yeah, yes. He was on this, he was on this yeah. show. And then just before he went off the deep end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think that, I think like James Lindsay is a good example of somebody who has, uh, who has done harm to his own cause by his his dogma and his online persona. Um, and I don't want to be somebody like that. I don't want to, you know, there, there's a certain number of people who, and I understand it because emotionally it is so difficult to be excommunicated from your own community, from your own side, that people turn into Trump supporters. And for me, politics isn't about sides like that. Politics is about policy. Um, and I think it's really short-sighted to, to, to change your opinion on what good policy is on things like economic policy and the social safety net and healthcare because people were, mad, were mean to you online. It's just so short-sighted. But I understand it. I emotionally understand it because I've been there and I've, you know, and when I've been dogpiled by the left then, and then the mm. right welcomes you with open arms. Yeah. It's tempting, but... I still disagree with them on lots of things. I do think abortion should be legal. I don't think that there should be prayer in schools. You know, I do believe in, in, in Medicare for all. And those things I think are more important than these online spats. Um, so, you know, they say that the personal is political. I think it should be less personal. You know, I think we should sort of move away from that. Um, yeah. So it is something that I think about, but I think that we have shown at least so far that we've been fairly good at resisting both audience capture and the uh, the siren song of of a conservative uh, conservative warmth. I, I think that is it's it's it is such a hard thing to do, and I, I think that's is what happened with James Lindsay, isn't it? He was so like welcomed on that side, and he became a bit of a bro. He's just like making these horrible jokes and things. I, it is funny as well, and I think I think it's something that we all like it, people. Those of us who try to see ourselves as these people who are like in the middle of everything and understanding both sides. Um, if, if I think about the videos that have caused like the most uproar online that we've done from this podcast, it's been like Helen Lewis, who's just like the most nice, just a nice, yeah. lovely person because she had that debate with Jordan Peterson. So all the Jordan Peterson fans. And it's like, I like Jordan Peterson. Not, I, got, I never said anything against him, but the amount of angry people. Oh, right. Well, she got divorced, you know. Of course, those people get divorced. Yeah. Um, so, so Helen Lewis, and whenever, and I was just thinking because I mentioned him before, Ben Shapiro. If I mention Ben Shapiro, and I've, I even say I like some of the stuff he says, but like I, I personally find it hard when when I'm hearing the. Where do you stand on Ben Shapiro? Because I and because Jordan Peterson's religious as well. I, I find you're not relig religious. Oh no, not no. that anyone listening. We've got no problem with listeners who are religious. Please still like the podcast. Yeah, I, I, and Peterson's religion I think is odd because he's sort of like, he seems. Like religious, but also atheist at the same time, if that makes any sense. Like he's very into religion itself. I don't know if he believes in like an actual higher God, but he's very into storytelling and myth making and all of this stuff. Um, Shapiro, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, I completely disagree with him on, on many, many things. I think he's smart. Um, and I think he's a compelling arguer. Part of that is just his sort of staccato delivery. He's just sort of like machines you down, machine guns you down with with facts. Um, I mean, I disagree with him, but I think that he is a, I think he's a smart guy and I can understand why he has been elevated to the position that he has um, because I think he's uh, more of an intellectual than you often find in, in like right-wing politics. But yes, this, I mean, he's deeply religious. I I'm an atheist. Yeah, I'm never get angry on this. And his, but he's also Jewish, so you know it's slightly it's slightly different than like the fundamental, slightly different than like the fundamentalist, you know, Baptist we have here. Yeah, well, so I think that might be why I've got a bit of a thing with him because my family's Jewish and mm -hmm. I grew up Jewish, like secular, mm -hmm. and like the guys who actually wear because he wears the kippah yeah, okay. or the couple yeah. on his head, yarmulkes. Yeah, so and that I've always sort of like because I guess I'm worried people will think that I'm like that, and it really puts me off. And I'm like, no, that's that's actually really yeah. extreme, and it is like I know loads and loads of Jewish people in in London, like loads, and I don't know a single one who, yeah. who wears that. So I think he's already quite far along yeah. for for somebody who 
who preaches the sort of the the facts don't have feelings thing. That's that's all I. But I'll get people writing in now, shouting at me. It's inevitable. That's why you should never read your email. Hey guys, it's time to delve a little deeper into the secrets of the human mind. So if you're new to the channel, I've put together a playlist of some of my best interviews here. And then just below it is a video that I think would be really good as a follow on. Don't forget to subscribe as well.